God, you're Ellie freaking Conway. Author of the Argyle series, Ellie Conway! I am such a fan. Oh yeah? What is it you do? Espionage. Congratulations on this film. And yes. I'm wondering, I'm going to start with you, Henry. Is the line, do you do the whirly bird? Do you consider that the greatest line in cinematic history? Because I think I do. I think only time will tell. I mean, we have to, <laughs> have to let it hit history first. <laughs> but um, it was a fun line. Yeah. Especially considering we, all, we pulled it off, you know. You both pulled off the whirly bird in, in well, practice. Thanks. I mean, in practice, he really did. Well, you both you both did. Yes, you both yes. really okay. both. I'll, I'll go with that. Well, yes. Well, you, sir, have been dancing in films. Tom Cruise has been running in films since 1981. I think you've been dancing in films since 1981. Let's keep it that way. Let's yeah. keep it that way. I'm wondering for you, was this your magnum opus in terms of dancing in film? Because uh, I feel like you've done no, a lot of the No, we're going to keep pushing it and yeah. pushing <laughs> it. Pushing that envelope. He'll be dancing yeah. in space next. <laughs> I yeah. want to see that. Can we create yeah. that movie right yeah. now? Yeah. <laughs> So it's still a work in progress for you. Yeah, it's you. a work in progress. Okay, right, but was that right. written, Was did Matthew write sort of the dancing in for you or? We've sort of found it along the way. We had an amazing dance team, Ash and Jenny, who helped Henry and I. There was stuff that we did that actually did end up in the movie, tap dancing and stuff. I heard about that. Yeah. 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 The tap dance was, was fun, but really, really hard. Yeah. It really sort of gives it's, you some respect for Gene Kelly. And yeah, what it's no joke, yeah. Yeah, you'll have it in your future repertoire for another film. That's right. Um, Matthew has said that when he sort of talked to you about this role, he said a little bit of Bond with a little bit of Drago, which is my favorite villain of all time mm -hmm. from Rocky IV. Nothing better. He terrified me actually as a child watching him. Pretty terrifying. Him. But was yeah. that sort of the direction you got? And sort of how did you craft craft Argyle for yourself? Um, yes, I mean that was as as far as the sort of uh, the physical description of him goes. But we sort of discovered him along the way because he's all the spy tropes turned up to 11. And he takes himself seriously, but the tone of the movie isn't taking him seriously, but sort of is. And so it's about treading that fine line between the interactions he has with with some characters like Ellie and then other interactions with, with John Cena's character. And you have to, you have to play both uh, recognizably similar, but different at the same mm, time. And okay. so it was sort of tricky to find along the way, but but it's what you do. And then the rest is done in the editing process. Yeah, because I was going to ask, because you played the obviously sort of the fantasy fictionalized version of a of a spy and you play the real version of a spy. So how do you sort of take the spy like in your head? Like if this is actor's studio one on one, how do you um, do you play it f for real or do you tweak it? I mean, speaking for Argyle, you, you can't play it too <clears throat> naturalistically. If you do, then you, you're missing the gag. Yeah. Um, so it was it was trying to play it real enough so it's not hammy, but also keep it not too honest. Yeah, I, I keep using the broadcast news as an analogy for the archetypes that we play. I mean, or, or Roger Moore and, you know, in the train scene, a, a, a hippie Indiana Jones. But but like, um, you know, I'm Albert Brooks. He's William Hurt. You know what I mean? Like I'm the, the journalist behind the scenes who's sweating uh, profusely and he's, you know, beautiful and fantastic. And so... That to me is the juxtaposition between our characters. I was going to use that word, juxtaposition. You stole it from me. Oh, well. Yeah, you can't use it now. I can't use it <laughs> can't now. can't use it now. You're just copying him at this stage. <laughs> I am. No, I heard something about like a Harrison Ford or like, yeah, like a Harrison Ford or like yeah. even a Han Solo. Yeah, maybe. well, yeah, sure. Stealing from all those archetypes, you know, uh, I think we're both taking from those, you know, you yeah. have to respect the, uh, the stuff that came before you. So I know you mimic each other in the sense like you recon each other's moves. Yeah. And the then fight you scenes, really yeah. make you each do the whirly bird. But That's you right. really made it your own. So how would you describe each of your whirly bird? His whirly bird is athletic. I just okay. I just had a good fortune of yeah, you know, Dua Lipa sort of being the, the pop star she is. She's she's used to doing sort of an insane dance move on stage and uh, without her sort of flexibility and, and her, her trust in me as well, uh, wouldn't have been possible. So does she just float and you just put your hands there? That's exactly what yeah. happened. That's kind yeah. of what I figured. Yeah. Levitate. And, levitate. And what was your take on the Whirly Bird, sir? Well, we sort of had, had got some help with some wires. You know, we, we did it both ways, Bryce carrying me and me carrying her. And, but we had also to do it with the fights, and it was very complicated, that yeah. thing. 
So it was a little different. It was a little different. But you do get dizzy either way. Yes. And generally. I know you mimicked each other's moves in the fight scenes. Yes. So what's one thing you stole from Henry and one thing you stole from Sarah? Well, I learned a lot from Henry. Henry's done a lot of fight stuff. And uh, just, you know, just to pace yourself and not, uh, you know, get a little carried away. You know, you kind of have, it's a long, it's a long scene. Yeah. You shot it over time and. It's easy to pull a muscle and, <clears throat> at my days, age. How many days would you shoot that over? I forget. I mean, we, we would come back to it and do yeah. second unit. It was originally a week or two, and then we came, we'd come back and pick up stuff. Right. And, yeah. What did you take from Sam? Um, I mean, it's impossible to take anything from Sam because only Sam could do Sam. And so it's only sort of poor mimicry of anything. <laughs> these people real life spies why would they care about me because you're a goddamn fortune teller ellie congratulations on such a fun and dynamic film i have a question for you bryce i know that you know who the real ellie conway is mm. i know you're not going to reveal who the real ellie but mm. is she going to be revealed and is it a big reveal um it's it is it, it's yes and it presumes that it's a woman too you're <gasps> Did I say she? Yes. I meant to say she, but I, I do have a theory. So I want to ask you, who is the real Ellie Conway? Wrong answers only. <laughs> um, the, uh, I mean, I really just even saying anything, I think that, you know, I, I could just suddenly there could be a dart that could come out of nowhere, hit me in the neck and I'm, you know, gone. Which, which so, has happened before. Yes, yes. yes. So we don't want to lose another one to this question. But um, but yes, there, there will the information will be coming out. And I know that because I keep begging for the information. Oh, I'm like, really? when's the reveal going to oh. be happening? So oh my it's gosh. cool. Adorable. It's cool. Yeah. I love it. Like, Well, I can't wait to hear. Um, in this film, Ellie has a vivid imagination. She is a writer who gets dropped in the world of espionage. So I'm wondering for each of you, if you or you got dropped into one of your previous films and it was a real life scenario, which one do you think would be the most fun to be dropped into? or one of your previous projects. And you can choose something you directed as well and acted. Oh, that's fun. Um, I mean, I, I, I love Spider-Man and I love that world. Um, so, you know, I think that would be a very fun world to kind of be dropped into in the Marvel the Marvel Universe. Can I also be dropped into Spider-Man too? Yes. yes. I think that would be fun. Wouldn't that be? It's it would so be a lot fun. of fun. It's so fun. Hey, yeah. I'm thinking of a future collaboration here now. Yeah, yeah. Spider-Gwen and our new villain. Why am I always a villain? Because you're so good, and the villain is what makes the movie. Like a movie's success is dependent upon you're the not villain. Just saying that. No, that's really actually. I'm not a just saying it either because that was actually my next question. Was asking you because you are such a craftsman of what you do. Um, sort of like the when you when you are playing a villain, there is a lot of pressure, right? There's a lot of pressure because the movie does have to work. Um, and it, a lot of it is based on the hero, but on the villain. So, what are Brian Cranston's rules for playing a villain? Make him real. Yeah. Make his uh, uh, choices and his uh, agenda uh, clear to to me, so that I can play it. And if I think if you if you play him evil or something, that that's an end result. That's something that you want the audience to determine, but not yourself. So when I was doing this or any character that is questionable, I always try to say. What is he really after? And why? How can I justify what he's trying to do? She represents, in my world, Ellie represented chaos and mm. things that are flying out of control. And I, I want to get things in order. And, and I'm trying to reason with her to make sure that she can come over to this side and, uh, and should be very comfortable. We'd make you very comfortable. <laughs> Did... Gru from Despicable Me, did I hear something about that? D did being, Gru? Yeah, being some sort of an inspiration or some, not that you need inspiration, but being sort of a nod to that? You know, it's it's funny you should say that because uh, someone mentioned that early on and I thought, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a relationship there where he doesn't see himself as a bad guy, you know, and, and that's fun to play that way. Maybe, maybe there is a future in it. Maybe Ritter, my character, can be animated. There you go. Yeah. For you, you got to wear so many hats. 
<laughs> playing this role. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much. One thing that you are known for is crying on cue. And oh. you got to do it probably, I think I was trying to count like five or six times oh, in goodness. this film. <laughs> and I know you're sick to death of talking about this, but was the taking off of the heels before you ran, was that your idea or was that Matthew's and is that a nod? It's so this is, I'm going to give you such a boring answer and I apologize, but it is the truth. I'm, I'm someone who's very, like, I, I, I don't think of, oh, this fun kind of Easter egg from this other movie that I did to put it into this movie because this movie is its own yeah. thing and treated as such. And, um, and the circumstances made sense you know you always want a costume to to make sense given whatever a character is doing and um and yeah and so that was you know that was just a like I knew there was going to need to be a shift so that she could go more stealth and um and so you know you're going to lose your shoes if you want to go more stealth and not be heard and that works when you're not in a jungle I love that you <laughs> use the word stealth that's perfect yeah. I'm going to say one word and you tell me if it means anything to you. Fuchs. Jason. <laughs> what, was this shouted out on set a lot? And what was the sort of meaning behind it? <laughs> uh, he's our uh, writer. Terrific guy. Very, uh, very talented. And a producer on the and film. And a producer yeah, on the film. Yeah. And um, the, as you might expect, the, the, the script is very dense and complex. It's not easily trackable because of the mind of Matthew. He wants to go to so many different places that there were often questions that the cast would have at any given moment. And and he would scream out, <laughs> you know, to bring Jason to the set. He'd come running to the set uh, to, to answer any questions. Sometimes the Fuchs became, it, it augmented to a curse word in, in some ways, in, in a fun way. So I'm going to start with you, sir. Dua Lipa, and I'm going to quote her, has called you her emotional support actor because the two films that she's been in, Barbie and this one, you were there alongside with her. Do you care to respond to that? And how do you feel about her? Is she your emotional support actress? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> I I don't take that lightly. Um, I I think I'm I'm incredibly grateful. Someone would say that. My my takeaway from that is we we did spend a lot of time on set, and in Argyle, it's a it's very different than what I did in Barbie. In yeah. Barbie, I was ridiculous. I sang to Dua Lipa horribly, <laughs> and I was wearing a merman costume. That was a different scenario, but that was actually the second time we got to work together. Argyle was filmed years before that, and that was kind of her dipping her toe into the cinematic experience. She was admittedly nervous and was vulnerable enough to share that with the group. Mm -hmm. And in movies, you shoot a little bit, then you stop down for a little bit. So we got to shoot and we got to talk. And she's a, a genuine, real person. We connected through our lives as touring performers and had much more uh, deep conversation than the normal just pleasantries that sometimes you have on a movie set. So when I hear like, this person is my emotional support actor, that to me, my takeaway is we talked, she listened, and she had as, she had as much to take away from that experience as I did. So that's really wow. cool because, uh, you know, everybody usually gets along. Yeah. But there's not a lot of circumstances where you form a deep connection with someone. Mm -hmm. And uh, if I could help her perform, she crushed in this movie. Yeah, she did. And if, if I was a vehicle to help do that, I'm grateful. But what I'm most grateful for is that the moments that I thought were genuine weren't lost. And that's that's important. Yeah. Well, thank you for that heartfelt answer. And it reminds me of your tweets. Because thank you for your tweets. Because sometimes I wake up in the morning and they give me inspiration. And I'm like, damn, he really has his finger on the pulse of what yeah. we need to hear. You yes. came off on the best dress thing. And now oh, yeah, I'm just here to suck up. Man. That's all. And by the way, I'm I take mermen very interview. seriously. <laughs> ah, okay. There's no joke there. That was yeah. no joke. No, and actually, thanks for that. it sort of feeds into what I wanted to ask you. Because I know you were cast in this before your Oscar-winning performance in yeah. West Side Story. And Matthew cast you because not as many people knew you at the time. So I'm wondering for you, if you can sort of talk about that experience from where you were then. Oh, well, I was just honored that he even liked my tape because I auditioned. I put myself on tape like if, like you do, you know, and um, I took the meeting with him and he was like, 
so I hear you're in West Side Story, like, da, da, da. and I was like, yeah, da, da, da. but like, I don't think he really put together I was playing Anita or anything, which right. wasn't really important to me because I just wanted to know that I could actually work, that I had the ability to get another job because that's the thing. Um, but we had a great time and he genuinely listened to like anything I had to say. Like I never felt small or anything like he validated my take on things and I really enjoyed that. I think trust between actor and director is really important. So I was just grateful that I felt like I had done a good job. I was going to work with someone who is very clearly a visionary and he saw me. And I thought that was just like a a, a winning ticket, you know. You're so I'm happy to be there. Today. My goodness, I was oh. not expecting that. But that was beautiful. I just saw <laughs> ISS and that was a beautiful performance as well. Oh, so, thank you. Yeah, you've had some projects since then. And in this film, Ellie's character is a writer and she writes about fantasy, but then she's actually dropped into that world and see she has to see how she does in that world. So I'm at, wondering for each of you, if you as people got dropped into the world of any of your previous projects, which one do you think would be the most fascinating to see how you navigate it? That's a good question. Uh, mm. th this one's not a bad one. Argyle's, it's pretty cool. Argyle's not a bad one <laughs> just because there one. are so many layers. I think every, everything or most all that I've done is, I don't want to say one dimensional, but what you see is what you get. Yeah. Argyle has so many secrets, so many twists, and so many layers that I think there will be options to write beautiful stories from oh, this one. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah, but I agree. I think I'd drop myself into this one. I don't mm. know if I would last very long, but I would give it a go. But it's also not a, not a period piece. You don't have to worry no. about like life without air conditioning or anything. Right? Right. right. Or like right. overly, <laughs> overly, like, overly in, in yeah. Yeah. clothes yeah. or anything. Good, good, good point. Yeah. Um, I know that you are a huge Kingsman fan. Yes. And you, we've talked about your wardrobe today. You like a well-cut suit. Like I know a John Cena suit when I see one. So I'm wondering if that was any incentive for working, and when you saw the Hawaiian shirt that you were going to wear, you were, were you like, where's my suit, man? No, not at all. Uh, <laughs> it's no secret. There's a line in Kingsman that says, a gentleman is the modern day knight, and a suit is his armor. And that resonates with me. I f this is what I feel most comfortable in. Everybody's like, man, yeah. you're overdressed. I, this is my uniform. This is the jorts and the t-shirt and the ball cap and the wristbands. I feel comfortable in this. Yeah. This is where I feel I'm my best self. But I don't mind crazy costumes, as you saw in Barbie and some of my other yeah. movies, I've been wearing my birthday suit. So <laughs> that's that's part of the fun of creating a character. So when you're a bit, you're able to step out of your comfort mm -hmm. zone, especially on screen, is exceptional. I wasn't asking Matthew where my suit was because I know he's got it for the next one. <laughs> love, love that answer. And by the way, I wear the same thing on the plane that I do to an award show that I do to this. Yeah, so just, I, you're, yeah. I feel seen and yeah. heard. Yes. Um, last question for you. Um, you sing a song. You're such a beautiful singer. And you sing a song that is on the soundtrack for this. Boy George. Yeah, I know. Oh, can Boy we talk George, about that? Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, he came on and, and wrote some additional lyrics to what we had already come up with. Or rather, Matthew Vaughn and L Lauren Balfe and... Um, Stuart Price and Gary Barlow originally wrote the tune that you hear in the movie. Boy George came on and was like, I got a little special sauce. And so that's what you hear in the credits. And, um, and now Rogers as well adds to it. And we just had a blast. We wanted to create a tune that felt, you know, truly electric that could, you know, provide this beautiful underbelly to this incredible film. It's and, a song um, that makes me dance. Uh, yeah. And you don't dance. And you don't dance. No, you see the, there's a video out there of all of us yeah. doing it. Yeah. 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 Thank cool. you. And I heard it's it. It's a great and, tune. Yeah. Man, I just went for it. Uh, you really so I'm did. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, never apologize. Do not apologize for feeling joy and being encouraged to move <laughs> by said too. joy. Um, but it was great. It was a great experience. And then also, if you do go to the film, stay for Electric Energy. And there's one other tune right after it called Get Up and Start Again, which is um, that I also sang, which feels like the most epic end credits Bond esque ballad that is very Argyle for us. So. Between the two of them, you will like something, I promise you. It's time for you to meet the real Agent Argyle. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. 
So I was actually just chatting with Bryce and I said something to her. She asked if I liked the film and I said, it is the girlier version of Kingsman. And she mm -hmm. said, well, Matthew made the film for his daughters in a sense, mm -hmm. or they were inspired it. So I wondered yeah. if you could talk a little bit about that. I mean, the fact that we have a Taylor Swift-esque cat pack in the film, Dua Lipa in the film, and yes. then it was maybe inspired by Romancing the Stone that you watched yeah. together during lockdown. Could you talk about sort of your children's influence in this and, and how they sort of, how it switches it up from Kingsman's. It, it actually, it is meant to be the antidote to Kingsman. So, um, antidote, the antidote. So, I don't know. <laughs> they, you know, when you have a daughter, you have a daughter. Yes, know? I do. And, and I can tell you, I think if you want to learn, well, for me, I think I've learned more about being a woman from my girls than anything. And if I don't learn quick, they yeah. tell me off quick. Exactly. Yeah. So they're in charge. Um, and they, they complained to me that they, they that um, they just said that they didn't ever feel the movies made for them, which they could really relate. They said it's always these, either a dumb rom com or it's. I won't even say what they are actually because I get in trouble. But you know they so they asked they said come on and they saw Romance in the Stone and said please make a movie like this for us. So I was like why not? Wow. And we did. Wow. Sir, for you, yes. I watched you in your, and I won't even call it a man cave because it was this lair that you have in this film. Mm -hmm. um, and I read something about how you brought in a desk specifically for Samuel. And I'm like, I wonder how sort of the sets, how you catered it to yourself and how it informed who you were. And this gentleman has said that you're you're undirectable, not because you won't take direction, <laughs> but because oh, you're Because that's so my favorite song. I sing that all the time when I'm on set, yeah. It, do yeah. you really? Yeah, so it's like undirectable. But he Every is. way. <laughs> I love it, I love it. But so, so how did you, if you were sort of like <laughs> a man on his own island, how did you craft this character? He gives me a lot of leeway. So when he called me and uh, spoke to me about the character and said, read it, see if you want to do it, and maybe you'll come play with us. And I was like, okay, great. And when I read it, I said, okay, good. I like this. And then I visited the set, and he asked me about the about the man cave. He said, how would you decorate wow. this place? So we started talking about the sports memorabilia that I wanted in there, the kind of people that I wanted to look at when I'm thinking, uh, sitting around in there, how many screens are dedicated to information, how many screens are dedicated to sporting events. So all these things played into that. Mm. And uh, and you taught me about American sport. I didn't know anything. Yeah. And the history, remember, I was, all right. I was yeah. like, yeah. I was like, what? Yeah, and we started talking about Negro League baseball. He didn't understand. Didn't even know that what could yeah. or would have existed. Yeah, so, so I was like, oh, okay. He allowed me to do that. And uh, he allowed me to create the character look because I essentially looked like this because I was here doing something else. And uh, my makeup artist, Jake, is a huge special effects person. So he just created that whole, he sprinkled glue and hair on my head and shaped it and did stuff on my face and everywhere. And he created it. And it's, 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 it's fun, the fun okay. aspect of doing this job, that when you find people that give you the opportunity to create something and bring it like he did, even in Kingsman, when I showed up, you know, I brought something that he didn't expect and he accepted it. No one expected it. <laughs> and, and you know. The lisp. Your, your double Which appearance. I probably get canceled for doing now, huh? No. But I get in trouble for doing it now. you argue that you overcame stuttering. So. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's true. a whole that's other true. thing. Yeah. But, um, no one's yeah, going to so he, he just totally allowed me to come in and create this guy and use the words that he had on the page to express who he was. And the words were perfect. I so love that you went big time. on this one too. You went so big the way we love to see you. I have to ask about the cat. You're going to ask a lot of cat questions. You're yes. like, of course. I know, I know. But well, you know. I, you're almost like Ellie Conway in a way because she couldn't go anywhere without her cat. She put him in the cat pack. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it, the same came true for you because this was your family pet mm -hmm. that you had to bring on set yeah. so did you feel like you and the cat were together 24 7 it was in i didn't trip? feel i ha i was <laughs> for me it was the nightmare of having a cat not you know for ellie is a dream for me it was a nightmare but i did fall in love with the cat by the end but at the beginning i i didn't think it through when i said i'm going to borrow the cat and became the cat handler the cat feeder cleaning cat litter i didn't even know i don't know how you train a cat to do it but they seem to know where to go to the loo um but it was, it, I, I love the cat now. I yeah. didn't at the beginning of the film. You didn't, even though it was your pet? I uh, no, they bought it without telling me. It was a big surprise yeah. coming home one day. We have a big German Shepherd, we have a German Shepherd. And I was like, I don't know if this is a good idea. 
Um, but I, I now do love Chip. And I, Chip was a great actor. He was good actor. Yeah. He was. Chip did great. He did. Yeah. Very um, impressed. Last question. Um, who is Ellie Conway? Who's the real Ellie Conway? Are you going to reveal this at any time? Because I'm told that it's a big reveal. Of course there is. Well, well, I don't know what a big reveal is, apart from the fact there is a, a, an Ellie Conway, the writer who wrote the book. Because everyone thought it was there was it wasn't real, and I said books don't write themselves. The book we, we just, just went straight in the charts at number fourteen, which is sort of phenomenal. I probably have to thank Taylor Swift for that, even though she didn't write it. Um, and, um, yeah, there will be, I don't know if it's a reveal. I mean, we, we, we were going to announce it, but it's become this big thing. So we're like, all right, well, there is a, there was a plan because we wanted the movie to come out first and then talk about the book. So give it a couple of weeks and it will be announced. Um, I it just, ain't going to be like Taylor Swift. I think everyone's, you know, I feel like saying it was, you know, it was Elvis Presley. It wasn't. Well, you could, the cats could have a play date though when you do the reveal. They could be there oh, maybe. together. Oh, maybe. I think you'd have to ask Taylor. Uh, yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm.